what is expected from the performer in terms of uh, improvisation? How much of what is written uh, shall the performer play? What do you think Sperger was doing in, the, in his performances that is not written in the score? Hmm. Hard to know. In his case, because he played his own music, so of course it's different if a composer writes something for somebody else to play or if he writes something for himself to play. And uh, of course in both cases I think there's a lot of freedom involved. In the case of Sperger, his scores are quite clear, but there might have been, a, f for sure, there's always an element of, of improvisation in, in anything that's a cadenza or a small fermatas, where you can improvise a, a flourish, it's just a couple of notes, just a, some fantasy. So I'm sure in these cases there was improvisation involved. Um, it's different when a composer writes something for another musician. Uh, you are supposed, as a performer, you're supposed as a soloist, because let's disting distinguish between a solo player and a tutor player in an ensemble, who has less freedom, obviously. But as a soloist, <coughs> of course, the composer, it's not like today, the composer knows the performer in ancient music. They're, they're close, they're in a, work, in a working environment, they're colleagues in a way, or the composer is uh, conducting the ensemble where the soloist plays it, so they know each other. Uh, so the composer knew the capabilities of the soloist, knew what he was capable of, knew his way of playing, knew his style. And I'm sure in most cases a composer would, again in the same spirit, would have welcomed the soloist to just arrange his part as it suited him, to change it or to uh, add to it or to make a cadenza or to change articulations, because let's not forget, in most of the ancient music, Baroque and classical music, uh, you can compare them to what we use in, in jazz music. When you have a score, a jazz score, you have the melody and you have the chord symbols, and that's it. Nobody in his right mind would say, if you play exactly what's written on the page, that this is jazz. It's got nothing to do with it. This is just a skeleton. This is just, and actually, Ancient music is a bit like that. You have what we call thin scores. It's a thin score, which means it only contains the bare essentials, the bare necessities, and you add to that, and you fill it in, and you, you improvise or you add whatever is needed in the circumstances. Um, so I'm sure the soloist in general was expected to play the piece in his personal way and to take the freedom to pretty much do what he wanted with it. Uh, it's very interesting because in one of Mozart's letters he says that uh, he made the aria too long because it's easier, he says, to cut something than to add something afterwards if it's too short. So this was a general idea back then that there's a lot of freedom and uh, it's interesting for instance uh, when we're talking about improvising during performance or especially of course during cadenzas. Cadenzas are free are uh, supposed to be improvised, which we don't do anymore. I have one student who does it, Michael Bilina, he improvises his cadences, which is really wonderful to witness. Uh, but you're supposed to improvise a cadenza. And uh, Kuanz wrote very interesting things about using cadenzas, uh, Joachim Kuanz, in his treatise. Uh, and it's very interesting when he, because, again, it's, it's important not to fix yourself on one thing. For instance, when we read Quanz, we go to the chapter about the double bass, and we read the chapter about the double bass, and the rest we don't read. But actually, you should read everything. And you read what he writes about cadenzas for wind instruments, he advises to make a cadenza that you can play in one breath. Nothing more. Just the number of notes you can play in one breath. And that's enough. And I think that's pretty good advice for a string player as well to make a short and sweet cadenza, not make a cadenza which lasts 15 minutes. Because the danger of uh, a cadenza is of course that suppose you play your movement really well and it's fantastic and it's beautiful and then you're going to destroy the effect 
by making a cadenza which is boring, which is not interesting, it's too dangerous. So just make it into a flourish, just a couple of notes and, and finish it. I think that's pretty good advice from Quanz. But uh, yes, uh, at least in the cadenzas there's improvisation. In the rest of the piece there's improvisation in, uh, in a different way. When we think about improvising we think about creating notes and creating something out of thin air, just creating something on the spot. But improvising uh, can be seen much wider than that. <coughs> improvising, we do that on the modern instrument as well. If you're a sensitive musician, you improvise in dynamics, you improvise in articulation, you improvise in emotion. Uh, according to the moment, you don't play exactly the same thing the same way every day. Every time you play this something different. It's a different day, it's a different audience, you feel differently, so in a way that's improvising too, with very tiny elements, with uh, dynamics, with uh, loudness, with tempo. You're going to take it a bit slower today because you just feel like it today. That's improvisation too. But back then I think improvising was a bit more extended than just the, these little things. So what is in a good uh, cadenza for you? A good cadenza, like I said, a short one. <laughs> I don't like long cadenzas, I really don't like them. And uh, there's a contradiction there, because when you look at Sperger's cadenzas, for me they're long and they're not very good, strangely. So I'm not really sure he was a prolific composer, he didn't only compose for the double bass, a very able composer. And then you see his cadenzas and you kind of disappoint, you think, hmm, did you really play that? Or was this cadenza which is written, was this just a kind of idea, a box of ideas from which he could take elements and really improvise on those, on those elements in the written cadenzas? For me it's a, it's a contradiction because you see the quality of his writing and then you see the quality of the cadenzas. Maybe it's me, but I think they're a bit weak and too long. I have a hot question. Is vibrato an ornament? Vibrato is an ornament, yes, of course. Well, of course, yes. For, for me, of course, yes. And it's, uh, the, it's described in, uh, in several treatises. Vibrato is considered an ornament. So there's no continuous vibrato. I'm not of the school that says there was no vibrato. Of course there was vibrato. It's, it's normal. The voice has a natural vibrato unless you suppress it consciously. So vibrato is part of the musical vocabulary. But there was no continuous vibrato, kein dauer vibrato as they say in German. Uh, like nowadays, we play everything with vibrato. It's like people who put ketchup on everything they eat. So you could say vibrato is like the musical equivalent of ketchup. And it's not necessary, because ketchup can be very nice, but I don't want it all the time on everything. And vibrato is the same thing. You don't need to vibrate everything. You have to choose your moments where you're going to vibrate a note. And then it becomes a really useful ornament instead of something that shakes from the beginning till the end. Yes, vibrato is an ornament to be used with discretion, yes. Could, could we compare playing every, every note with vibrato uh, to playing every note with a trader? Yeah, almost, <laughs> almost. I think for, for the ancient uh, musicians it would probably have, uh, have sounded something like, uh, yeah, a bit similar to that, playing every note with a trill and uh, play every note vi vi with vibrato. It would have seemed, I think, it would have seemed just as silly to do that. Yeah. So I see here you have uh, set up like a small bow shop. Well, the bow is a very interesting subject, of course, because we have the instrument and we have the bow. And um, we kind of assume, or a lot of people, or most bass players assume, that Vienni's bass was played in this way, right? With a, what we call German bow now. I don't like to use the terms German bow and French bow because they're too political. And uh, it's, it's really something political and it's uh, with reminis reminiscences of wars and stuff. And uh, I prefer to use underhand and overhand, but anyway. So most bass players automatically assume, since this is a Germanic country, let's say, it's all German bow. But actually we have no proof of that. We, we don't really know. And uh, some people get really 
tied into knots about it and they get crazy about it and they get very angry about uh, people who play ancient music like this. Uh, but there's no proof. Uh, the interesting thing is that the Viennese bass bows uh, haven't survived. We don't know any Viennese bass bows except maybe the bow that uh, uh, Professor Klaus Strumpf found in a, in a broom cabinet in Schwerin, I think, which is called the Sperger bow. Did it belong to Sperger? We don't know. Did he hold it like this? We don't know. We, have, we hardly have any pictures, uh, especially about the Viennese uh, period specifically, so we don't know. Um, it could be, I don't say it's not, it's not true, it could be, but I'm open to all the possibilities and uh, I find that uh, an overhand bow style suits the Viennese uh, technique very well because Viennese double bass technique due to the, to the tuning in thirds and fourths, especially the thirds, you have to, to change strings a lot because you play one note and you ha you're on to the next string. So there's a lot of bow changes and the bow changes are quite a bit easier with an overhand bowing than with an underhand bowing. That being said, uh, the players back then must have been really incredible bow players because uh, whichever way you hold the bow, there's a lot of work for the bow there, really, sometimes of three or four strings, all kinds of uh, figures with uh, slurs and dotted notes. And, uh, so it's technically for the bow it's quite, uh, quite demanding. Um, so actually I use three bow holes on the Viennese bass. Most of the time I use a German underhand bowing. Then for some things I use an overhand bowing sometimes. And then, for instance, for uh, what I really like for the Van Hal second movement, I just use gamba tuning, gamba, gamba bowing. Gamba bowing. Yes, and it works very well. Uh, is that historically correct? Maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it is, but it works well. So I would uh, keep an open mind about all these things because uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't always think that we know the truth because anyway it doesn't matter. What matters is how you perform the music and especially how you touch the audience with your music because this is for me personally a, a very big topic is that we as musicians we're so concerned about bows and strings and technique and uh, fingers in the right place and I've never heard during all of my studies no teacher has ever pronounced the word audience or public or listener, never ever, which to my mind is an aberration, it's because in the end that's what we're going to do, we're going to play for an audience, we're going to play for people, we're going to have to transmit some emotion to the listener, otherwise why should they come to the concert? So in this view, holding the bow like this or like this or any other way is secondary to how you're going to transmit the music's emotion to the audience. And if, f if this works better for that purpose, and if in the next piece this is better for that purpose, then I will just change. So th the main criterion is for me is this, how can you translate the music to an audience for an audience today, now? So the technique, you see I have uh, ten bows here, I have m uh, a few more. But uh, they're all different, they all have different sound colors, different playing properties and I try to find the bow which suits the music best and uh, which enables me to, to give the emotion to the audience. Th they're just tools for me, just tools in order to obtain this. What about the strings? The strings, yeah, well we, we know for sure that uh, they used uh, gut strings, of course, there were no steel strings yet. Uh, as at, at least not for the bass, they had steel strings for other instruments, uh, for some uh, folk instruments or the viola d'amore, very early on uh, already had steel strings, steel wire, but there were no bass strings in steel. I have some bass strings here, oh, there they go. <laughs> so they're quite thick of course, they're much thicker than steel strings for the same, for the same uh, pitch. They're quite light, they're wound gut, 
And uh, so we're quite sure for the top three strings, they use plain gut. And probably for the lower two strings, so the uh, low A and the low F or D or whatever, uh, they used wound metal wound gut strings. But um, we're not really sure exactly at what moment we had uh, wound strings. And personally, I prefer four plain gut strings, even for the low A, and just one wound string for the, for the lowest string. Um, not just for the tone quality, the sound quality. I, I prefer the sound quality of a plain gut A string, but also for practical reasons, because uh, the problem with wound strings is that uh, the core, the string's core is in gut, and it's wound with metal. Now what happens over time, when the string dries out on the inside, the gut dries out, it shrinks, and the metal wrapping gets loose. And the sound will be muffled, and would, the sound will disappear, the sound quality will be gone, and that's another expensive, expensive string that you can't use anymore. So uh, these strings, if they shrink, it doesn't really matter all that much. There's no wrapping that can come loose. So I prefer plain gut. Now, of course, there are, if you want to play uh, Viennese tuning on a modern bass, you have so many uh, metal strings you can use. For the F-sharp, you can use a G-string uh, tuned one step lower. You can use a heavy gauge G-string, but it's not really necessary. For the top A, you use a solo string, solo tuning string. So you can find a, a set that balances well in, a, in modern tuning. Uh, maybe are there Viennese tuning sets in uh, the market? There are some. I think um, there's an American. I think Gamut makes a, a dedicated set for Viennese tuning. But usually you just uh, uh, find the, the exact string gauge, the thickness of the string, uh, with a string maker. And uh, I have my string gauges that I prefer. And I have a string maker, uh, Nicholas Baldock, in Germany who makes my strings. Of course, for the E, F, the A and the D string, the lower, D stri uh, lower A and D, you can find commercial strings because they exist. But the F sharp string and the A string are more difficult, so I have them, uh, those at least I have always, uh, I order them from Baldock. Um, what's interesting maybe in this connection is that, um, is the pitch. Uh, it's very interesting to understand that Viennese basses, I think, used quite thin strings, not the big fat gut strings that uh, other Baroque uh, instrumentalists use. We use a thinner gauge of string uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, the string length, as I said, uh, the average string length of a Viennese double bass is around 110 centimeters with excesses going to 112, 114 centimeters, which is really quite long. Uh, and the, the longer your string, the more tension it will have for the same thickness. Uh, so it would be interesting to have a thinner string to, to have a bit less tension. Uh, the second thing is that the bass players then, or musicians back then, had to switch between different tunings. You have the Kirchenton and the Kammerton, and uh, between them you could have up to a tone, a whole tone difference. And sometimes within the same day or within the same week, you had to tune up and down between two, two different pitches. Uh, so it would, be, it would have been more interesting to have a, a string that's not too thick if you really have to tune it up to a, to a high pitch, like something like 460, 460 hertz. Uh, that's, that's quite high, so a thinner string would have been more practical. Mm, also, a thinner string on the Viennese bass if you want this silvery resonant quality, a thinner string sounds better than a thick one. The thicker string is good for ensemble playing for a, a fat, bassy sound. But strangely, the Viennese uh, double bass actually has a kind of sound quality that's not so basso profundo. It's more like a baritone quality, so it's a very silvery sound, especially in the, in the high register. So it doesn't really always sound like a double bass. It sounds like... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to insult bass players. <laughs> it's, it's, 
No, no, it shouldn't sound like a cello. No, 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 no. No, but uh, it's got a gamba-like quality, uh, violone-like quality uh, in, the, in the high register. So um, these are interesting things. I always tune my Viennese bass to 415, which is a semitone lower than uh, modern pitch. Um, there's a standard pitch today for classical music, which is 430. Uh, I don't like 430. <laughs> it's, it makes life too complicated and also it's an artificial tuning. It, there's no, nowhere in history did it exist. There was no 430 before. So it's something, it's a modern invention, 430. There was no 430. There was no standard pitch anyway. In one city it was 415 and there it was 422. Based and on the organ maybe. And yes, very, yeah. very often based on the organ. Uh, so there's, there was no fixed pitch, there was no standard of 415 or 430 or 440 that didn't exist. Uh, but I find it hard enough to have two pitches for 415 and 440 without using 430. I, don't, I have no use for 430. Uh, it doesn't make much sense for a string player anyway. It's a, it's a quarter tone. A semitone, okay, but a quarter tone for me is not very useful. Uh, but the 415 sounds warmer than the 440, that's for sure. It's a semitone lower, it's, it's got a bit, it sounds a bit more relaxed, a bit more open. So that's the tuning I, I really like for Viennese tuning. Um, you can tune to 440, you can tune any way you like, but uh, I like thin strings, uh, plain gut for the first four strings and 415. That's my personal recipe. <laughs>